1590 The Talk of the Treasure Coast. You're on Money Info, brought to you by Princeton Research. And I'm not really sure whether uh, Charles is going to make that photo shoot with the Miami Dolphins cheerleaders. Are, are I'm not, you? I'm not that. You're not what? <laughs> and, didn't they say, and didn't they say Florida residents? Uh, well, yeah, but I mean, hey, you're, you're, uh, you know, your family's down here, so, you know, hey, works for athletes. <laughs> Why not you? <laughs> so how you been? Great. Good stuff. Well. Great for a, great, great for a you know, sloppy, relatively low volume summer market. Yeah, uh, Everybody's on vacation. Oh, hey, it's our oil man. Thank you very <laughs> well, much. We're, we're not on vacation. No, uh, thank you very no, much for no, uh, only lowering the, our prices. The hardcore, the hardcore guys are still around, <laughs> even on vacation. <laughs> See, that's the, prob- that's, that's the problem with the oil market. You guys continue to pump instead of taking a vacation and letting the supply-demand situation get back into the right direction. Absolutely. I mean, you've got more IEA data out today, and then, of course, the Goldman Sachs note this morning that's got everybody a buzz that uh, they're looking for sub-$40 oil, which we talked about. You know, the new IEA data says, once again, worldwide energy investment fell 12% in 2016 after falling 60% in 2015. And we're going to see a shock here someday. We just don't know when it's going to happen. I guess the old saying, in the long run, we're all dead. (laughs) We don't know when this is going to happen, but everybody's investing in this cheap thrill shale. Shale brings in big production, steep decline rates. So if you're a public company, you got to be in the Permian Basin, you got to be in the Eagleford, you got to be in the scoop and stack, and you drill your wells and you get a whole bunch of production, and a year later it's dropped by 75%. Ooh. And really? Oh, yeah, that's the nature of those shale wells. They drop very, very quickly. And so, you know, this is like cocaine time for the industry, is they found these easy plays, but these are steep decline play production and already uh, art berman who is a fantastic analyst out of houston recently did an analysis on the eagleford and he believes that the eagleford initial production numbers have peaked out and started to drop based on his data from 2016 uh-oh well <laughs> that happens everywhere and the eagleford only started in 2012 really and here it is 2017 so five years later the initial production numbers are beginning to decline. And when that happens in the Permian Basin, Katie, bar the door. Yeah, but so Tim, I... I is it going to go higher? Oh, yeah, I definitely okay. do. But I think that it's three to four years out because right now, until they get through all these properties they've bought, and let's face it, the capitalism, what it's all about is it's the most efficient, last man standing wins. We don't really give a damn about the Saudis, the Qataris, Kuwaitis. If they want to artificially lower their production, God bless them. We're going to keep producing it. We're going to produce it cheaper, and we're going to produce it at at, uh, more barrels for less money in CapEx. But somewhere down the line, decline rates are going to hit the scale back of CapEx, and these steep decline rates in the shales really are going to show, and we just don't know when that is. But I I agree, it's a great time really to be acquiring properties and not necessarily drilling them. If you're capital constrained, good time to go after independents who are all starving to death and are dying for cash, can't get money for wells, to just buy their leases and inventory them and wait. Wait and see what happens. Well, Tim and uh, Jared Kushner's in studio now, and he just said that you know we're just going to sell our oil to Russia. It's <laughs> 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 terrible. <laughs> uh, I'm pretty sure the Russians have some oil of their own, but uh, you know the Russians uh, have very high lifting costs too, and so they and a lot of their old fields are starting to get depleted. So it's it's 
it's a time for really, really astute technical study, which, as you both know, most buyers don't do. Aren't the Russians a little upset at us over, you know, um, some of the new agreements with some of the old Eastern Bloc countries? Uh, to, you uh, bet, send because we're there. taking market share from them. Yeah, okay. We're, there you go. We're, we're selling at discounts to WTI, and we're shipping VLCCs of crude over to, to China. China was the number one purchaser of U.S. foreign purchased oil Ooh. in the last month or two, I think. Okay. But, yeah, we're penetrating markets, and they don't like it. And Texans have a tendency to say T.S., <laughs> yeah, I, I was going to say, I'm, you couldn't care I'm less. Sorry, out there. you don't like that I'm selling cheaper than you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, you guys are one of the craziest countries around out there, that's for sure. Yep. Yeah, well, well I think the U.S. would be in trouble if you did secede. Well, I, I just think today is a real time for caution in buying into that market. I think that you've got to be looking very carefully and you've got to watch that investment daily because doesn't it feel like this thing's kind of on the cusp of a bubble is it me just imagining it or everybody's praying for 50 and thinking about 30 i i don't see any catalyst that's going to make prices move up to 60 or 65 like uh who was it raymond james put that out the other day i mean i I just don't see that catalyst there. Any other thoughts? I hate being the only one talking about it because I know you guys yeah. well, are both knowledgeable you know, traders. Well, right? you know, the, the best cure for low prices, you know what that is. I know. It's the Mike King saying of the career. Low prices are the cure to low prices. And and that's especially <laughs> true in the oil patch. And, yep. and if you look at what's, what we've been doing, um, we're ignoring – the oil, quote, the oil story, personally, I don't believe in it. What I believe in right now is twofold. As uh, Tim has mentioned before, uh, you know, the people who are going to be able to make money in this business are the people who are using technology and are, are have the lowest lifting costs. But from yep. the standpoint of the overall market, we're trading two instruments, and we trade them constantly. The OILU, which is the leverage ETF for oil to the upside, and the SCO, which is the leveraged oil ETF to the downside. And every time it gets to 43, 44, we buy the OILU. And every time it gets to 48, 49, we buy the SCO. And, uh, you know, it's a trading range. Uh, you know, I don't think you need to be concerned right now about, you know, the story. Because yep. the story's going to work out however the story's going to work out. But the supply and demand in the marketplace has remained pretty constant now for quite some time. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a trading range here that has made trading it a whole different story than quote, the oral, oil story. So Absolutely. If you can trade in a range of $5, you can make a lot of money. Sure. Well, as long as it that, but stays, are, stays these range are, bound. These are triple leverage. Yeah. So if yep. the price of oil goes up uh, from 44 to 48, that's 10%. The OILU goes up almost three times that. Whoa. I mean, you know, it's not for it's not for the faint of heart, but you know, we've been using stops on both sides of the market, and you know, just trading it as we see it. But you know, Tim, I all all of you guys have talked about, you know, this crazy oil patch, you know, for decades now. But what about? like the supposed relaxation of some of the environmental rules. Is that going to make any difference? Or does this kind of get back to what you were talking about, the fracking, which I thought was fascinating. <laughs> Where You equated that to the cocaine for the uh, oil industry. Um, is fracking a flash in the pan? 
Oh, no. No. Fracking is not only uh, the most uh, legitimate and proven way of increasing production. The fracks now are, some of them are ten times larger, more sand, more propent than they were five years ago. Okay. And they're, that's one of the secrets to all of this new production that's coming, is putting in more sand, putting in more chemicals on these initial productions, and they're getting big numbers, 600 to 1,200 barrels a day in new wells coming out of the Permian Basin today. And but, so you know, it, those stocks are not really reacting. The CRR um, and the other suppliers of that stuff are really not reacting to the rest of this. I mean, they're down pretty hard. They went down, and like the retailers, they've never come back up. I mean, is there is there a new technology that eliminates, um, uh, you know, the necessity to use that stuff? It sounds like it's just the opposite. No, I mean you've got a, you've got two majors out there supplying the industry, and it could be the smaller guys just aren't getting the market share anymore because the uh, smaller service providers are really suffering, and many many of them are actually closing down now because in getting these cuts in prices of oil field servicing, the majors have all negotiated contracts. For instance, our old friend, Craig Crawford, Mike, he yeah. had to renegotiate a deal for the expansion of the North Slope for Exxon when he's the head of that for CH2M Hill, and they were demanding 25% cuts. Well, they ended up with 17% cuts, but they also ended up with longer-term contracts, and they're doing more work than anybody else. So people give up margin, but the trade is, is give us all your work. And that's not good for the smaller players. Smaller players suffer through that. So hmm. what is going on up in Canada? I know they were uh, producing a lot of oil in western Canada, Alberta, and place, place environs west. Well, tar sands is expensive. I know it's dropping, but I, I haven't heard of any huge breakthroughs that they're going to get tar sands lifting costs below probably $30 a barrel, and they're now producing in and the Permian a, at $9 a barrel. That's also a very heavy oil. It's not the quality oil we yes. have. Yeah, I was just going to say that. It's more expensive. Oh. To, uh, right. Okay. And, except here's what's happening. We're producing so much light oil, we're having to buy heavy oil to blend for it to run in the refineries now. Over time, the refineries adjusted because when – before the Permian hit and the Eagleford, we were starting to get heavier and heavier oil, and so the refineries had to be retrofitted to take heavier oil. Well, now <laughs> all this oil coming out that's so light, they have to blend it with heavy oil to get it to refine well in these new systems and these cat crackers. So it's interesting how they have to constantly adjust as to what's happening in the market there. But uh, that's why people are still buying Canadian tar sands oil right now. Just saw an article on this not two weeks ago. Wow. Okay. So it is a market that is only for the fleet of foot. <laughs> yeah. If you're going to be in the SEO and the OIOU, you better be watching it because I've ha I've been blown through on my sales stops on those when I wasn't watching them before. And it's a great vehicle when you want to really bet either way. I love them. I think they're great, but it's for really experienced traders who are watching their monitor all day long. Yeah, I never lost <laughs> And that it's the same with those triples in the oil. I'm sorry, I didn't get to hear what you said. I, I said never lost the same money. as the triples in the oil as when I was trading oil. Oh, uh, yeah. uh who's this? Is this Gary? It's Gary. Hey Gary. Yeah, go ahead, ask Tim. Well, I just did. And I just made a statement that just uh, it's Tim is spot on unless you're at that terminal ready to go with a finger on the trigger, you could have a problem quick. Wow. Yeah, that's, <laughs> this is way beyond me, guys. I mean, this is really heavy-duty stuff here you're talking about. Well, well we're, it's really, it's really a, a major at odds between the story and the trading. Uh, I, I mean, if I, I know people who are locked into the oil trade because they believe in it 
and they own all of these uh, either surface companies or some of these oil companies that just, you know, of course they came off the bottom. I mean, you know, you, you get some of the uh, really big names uh, with, you know, really good reasons to be there. APC and the Darko. I mean, is there a company, is there a company with um, a better inventory of places to be? And, you know, you're sitting here and you're looking at a stock that while last year it came off the bottom uh, and it was a pretty severe bottom, uh, you know, the beginning of last year down in the $30 area and managed to get all the way back to 70 Well, it's 43 here and it's way oversold. But every single day that I look, it's just given up just a little more. Or, um, let's see, CVX. You know, yes, it's, you know, it's had a great run. But, uh, you know, you're, there are people locked in these trades that, you know, just can't see the light of day. And that, again, I characterize that as the oil story as opposed to trading. You know, I mean, it's uh, the same thing if you look too closely at, uh, at uh, Amazon or uh, Google or Apple. If you, Well, not Apple because it's got a great fundamental story. But if you look at, you know, some of these other things that have, uh, you know, almost absurd, and I'm not bearish on them, but they have almost absurd PEs. Uh, you know, this is back to the 2000.com stuff where, uh, you know, it's the this time it's different mentality. <laughs> um, you're you're bad, and, and you know, and as everyone who's on this line knows, it's never different. It is absolutely never different. You know, the same the same um, underpinnings in any of these markets is you know it, it, you need to be in touch with that. I, I laugh sometimes when I see some of these guys uh, come on CNBC or Bloomberg or really whatever, where they say, oh, well, you know, this is down 5% from the high, you know, down 5%, we buy it. <laughs> wow. <laughs> you know, yeah. they've never been in a bear market, ever. Amazing. They're, they're that kind of young. They have no sense of history and what it takes to really have a story. So, you know, they're buying CVX down from 116 to 110, and then they're buying it between 110 down to 102. And, you know, how's it going to look at 96? Uh, you know, it just doesn't make any sense. So that's really kind of a problem here. By the way, do we have any idea what the Strategic Reserve has as far as quantity and cost? Because every once in a while you hear somebody, some politician come up and say, well, you know, why don't we just sell some of the strategic reserve stuff since we're producing so much? I think What's really the point of holding it? Isn't there their strategic reserve there in case we get into a war? I mean, sure. Yeah, but that's not what they use it for. They've used it for political reasons to do exactly, exactly. To, to fill in a budget gap. Which shouldn't be, and then we we lose that strategic value. Yeah, and but I mean, that's what w one of the proposals that Donald Trump made. Uh, this was back in May to sell off half of the strategic oil reserve to generate cash. Interesting. You know, and what really a stupid time to do it. it. Sell it at a hundred dollars, not forty three dollars. Yeah, right. right. Exactly. Well, did you guys hear? Uh, I, I, I love my 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 old state. Um, California. <laughs> the boys in Sacramento have done it again um, because of, especially in San Francisco and Los Angeles, large electric car sales. They are looking at taxing electric car owners anywhere between five hundred and a thousand dollars a year for owning electric cars and then of course you know the the gas tax uh, 
revenue would be going which down. Is, which is really funny, Greg, when you consider that in the beginning for electric cars, there were federal and state subsidies to get you into them. I know. I know it. Well, <laughs> they're going to get you into them, and now all of a sudden the states, and actually, Mike, Nevada was one of the states that's going to start considering that. Uh, or Oregon. Well, they always follow California. So it's it's like California, Oregon, Washington's looking at it, and so is Nevada. Um, man, if I owned an electric car right now in any of those states, I'd really be ticked off. Well, you know, this is going to come down to the same old story for our pal Gary. Because the number of Teslas that I see in Connecticut is you know, head and shoulders above everywhere else. <laughs> They're and, like and we've discussed this be- we've like Volkswagens this everywhere else. <laughs> There's a lot yeah, of well, them around town, yes. I'll well, bet. You know, and so, you know, that's, you can be sure that they're going to jump on the bandwagon because they just live to tax. Oh, Connecticut, Connecticut is the worst. I mean, I, I know. It, that's why I'm saying it, it. You know, it is the absolute worst. Um, if there's a tax that they can think of, they'll implement it. Um, I was just down in Washington, D.C. for the last few days. One of the things that surprised me that Connecticut doesn't have, that Virginia has, is, and I never knew this even existed, they tax you via um, uh, the Easy Pass. If you don't want to be in the traffic, there are other lanes you can take, but you need to pay oh, yeah. for them. I never heard of such a thing. And this explains why <laughs> Connecticut has is, is been pushing to increase the width of I-95. It's not to minimize the traffic. It's to tax maximize revenue. The revenue. <laughs> I love it. So, so well, the, uh, uh, yeah. What's, what's interesting, Gary, is that the, the number of those lanes are mostly away from I-95. They're on the ones that go through the middle of the state um, and through Hartford and north from there. I mean, I looked at that. I I made that trip not very long ago because there was too much traffic on I-95 and, you know, the app on the phone sent me that way. Uh, I mean, the roads north and northeast from and through Hartford, they're mega highways. Yeah, I mean, they're well, six lanes wide. Let me let me give you guys some quick data before I have to drop off on this vaunted <laughs> electric vehicle <laughs> taking over the market. Yes, yeah, spoken like as a true oil guy. Yes. As of no, this came out today. Okay. Out of the IEA report released yesterday. If you drive an EV in the U.S., sixty-five percent of the electricity is generated from fossil fuel, natural gas thirty-four percent, and coal thirty-two percent. A maximum comes from renewable energy of 7%. They estimate that by 2025, that will be all the way up to 10%. And what happens if all of these subsidies drop? Oil and gas ain't going away anytime soon. And Volvo is still going to be selling (laughs) gasoline-powered cars in 2020. Good point. Oh, man. I... I (laughs) I I love it. Well, you know, we'll we'll just keep this debate on gas vehicles going for the next fifty well, years. Thank you, Tim. <laughs> All right, thank Timmy, you very much. Thank guys. you so much. Sorry, Tim. Okay. Let's welcome Eric Bauer from RMS Medical. Oh, poor Eric always gets trapped up in our uh, transportation segments here. <laughs> How are you? Hello, Eric. Uh oh. Hopefully, Eric's still there. Um, yep. Here's Eric. Welcome, Eric. Eric Bauer. Hey, there you are. Well, we were just debating electric engines and uh, gas power. I think we had the same debate with you about uh, two months ago. <laughs> <laughs> yes, indeed. <laughs> yes, indeed. And I'm, uh, I'm all in favor of electric engines, if you can get the cost down. Yeah, there you go. Well, we were just talking about California and, and uh, what could conceivably be Oregon, Washington, and Nevada that is going to be taxing uh, owners of electric cars as much as 500 to to $1,000 a year. Um, 
because they are using the roadways and, of course, not paying gas taxes. <laughs> oh, huh. yeah, oh. you, you know, somebody has to pay those taxes. Oh, man, it never stops. So how are you that guys is, doing? You know, that is interesting. I hadn't thought of that issue, yeah. Well, you knew some politician somewhere would. Uh, but uh, anyway, so how are you guys doing? Uh, we're doing great at RMS. So, so what? we're busy uh, doing a lot of different things and, uh, you know, uh, moving forward in an exciting path here. Uh, it's a, been a busy summer. We, it, this is our trade show time, so we've been running around to a number of different trade shows, uh, both in Europe and in, um, in the U.S. And we also had a uh, – we just recently had um, a, uh, all of our customers in Europe together. Uh, we all – uh, pulled them all into a meeting in Budapest. So it was the first time I ever went to Budapest, Hungary. But um, uh, we had uh, all of our European customers in, and we shared with them our vision for the business and where we're going and all the improvements, and they were very excited about our our future and uh, our relationship with them. So uh, we're having a, a great uh, first quarter. We've exceeded all of our uh, financial uh, numbers for the first quarter. So we're doing really good. Uh, have a lot of exciting things coming along in terms of uh, new products, new products that I, c I can't really share openly yet because it's uh, highly confidential, but we're investing in uh, new products, and um, I think we have some great things that we'll be launching in, in the near future. And um, we have new packaging and new marketing and all kinds of exciting things going on. You can share your secrets with us. We only have a few Russians listening, so you're, you're <laughs> yeah. good to go. Well, as long as Donald Trump isn't listening. <laughs> yeah. I, well, I've got a question. Uh, you know, a few months back, um, you had mentioned that you guys were uh, searching for a uh, new hub, a manufacturing hub. Uh, is that uh, – are you still looking? Yes, we are. In fact uh... – we're well. We're what it is is we're looking for a new building. We've out uh -huh. uh, the business has outgrown the building that we've been in. Uh, we've been in this uh, our current building for uh, 20 years, and uh, our we've just flat out outgrown this building. So we need to uh, find a new building. And I uh, actually have a meeting this afternoon with um, a local contractor who's going to show us some designs uh, for a, a, a building that they're building. Uh, which is in in the local area. We're not going to. Oh, okay. We're, we're not going to disrupt our um, our current workforce and anything at, at this point. So uh, we are looking for a, a building in the area, and I think we found a location. Uh, so we have a meeting this afternoon to uh, discuss the uh, the particulars and uh, see whether or not this opportunity may pan out for us. Well, that would but, be great. Uh, yeah, we're very excited about it because um, this particular contractor is uh, is is uh, willing to build to suit. So he has a location, and uh, and um, he would actually build a building to our design. And it's always better when you're in the type of business we're in, especially where we our products are made in clean rooms and. Uh, there's a very particular flow that has to take place, and, and we are also a warehouse hub for all of our U.S. customers. So it's best to actually design a building that kind of fits your needs sure. as opposed to go into an existing facility and try to renovate it and, and force fit yourself into it. So we're, we're hoping that uh, this will work out with this particular builder, and uh, maybe we can uh, come to, to actually design a building that would be ideal for us. Well, and uh, I think what's neat there, and, uh, you know, I know you had, one, you had mentioned that you were looking possibly in Jersey or other places like that. I mean, uh, boy, if you could uh, keep it local, uh, you wouldn't disrupt any of the employees, which I'm sure is a, a primary goal of yours. Yeah, it's very important to, to maintain a stable workforce in, in any company today. Um, our turnover is, is really relatively low. We, we just did a study of, of companies similar to ours, and 
the turnover in those companies has is, is been in the 15% range. So can you imagine, you know, 15% of your employees turning over every single year? And, uh, and our employee base has been running, a, uh, turnover is about 4%. So we're substantially lower than, than many of the companies that are in uh, our similar industry or in this, loca- in this area. Uh, but turnover is really expensive and um, uh, because of the recruiting costs, the constant uh, t- retraining of people. So you want to maintain a stable workforce as much as you can uh, for as long as you can. And we've been able to keep our turnover uh, really relatively low uh, for uh, an organization our size in, in this particular area. That's great. So we're pretty happy about that. Yeah, that's great. I think our newest employee came to us about 15 years ago. I mean, it's uh, it's we we have there been, you go. That's good. Yeah, we've been very very blessed. There's no doubt about it. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, Turn- tell us turnovers are very expensive for. Oh yeah, these days. you bet. You bet it is. You bet it is. Well, so tell us we about. We put a lot of time and effort into. Uh, uh, in fact, we have a set of goals uh, for our company. And one of those goals is our uh, really driving improvements in our culture. Uh, and, and culture is one of the most difficult things to change in a company. It's very easy to change procedures or to change products. And <clears throat> but once a company has an established culture, it, it's a very difficult thing to change culture and to move it in a, in a direction that you want it to go. And uh, so we're... We've sort of refined our, our goals for our culture. And when I used to talk about culture, I talk about things like communications and team, teamwork and the things that go into uh, creating an environment where you can minimize the turnover, where people really like to work there. They want to stay there and want to work there. And uh, so we uh, have a very concerted effort as an executive team to build a culture here that uh, where, where people really get up and really enjoy coming to work every day. And I tell people who work for me, if you don't like what you're doing, come to me. Let's find something that, you know, especially for the ex- – we really focus on trying to hire exceptional people. And uh, so you don't want these people to leave. And so generally we try to move people around, give them challenging assignments. We put them on teams and have them solving problems as teams. So you build a culture that is uh, motivating to people, that they come in and they like the people that they're working with, they like the, the communications from management, they know, they're know they aware of everything that's going on in the company and where we're going, what the vision of the future looks like. You do this, <clears throat> and all of this is, you know, is, is, uh, takes a little effort on part of the executive team to to take the time to have the communications and everything that you need to go on. But all, overall, it lowers your cost. You, you have more productive people. You have less turnover in the company. So it's well worth, um, you know, building, focusing on the culture within the business uh, to move it forward. Wow. Yeah, that, it, it's amazing. Uh, you know, you, <laughs> you've hit everything uh, right on the head. And, uh, sure, uh, retention is, uh, is everything. Uh, there's no, there's no doubt about it. What's the reaction been around? Uh, you talk about uh, going to the shows. Um, uh, what's the reaction to RMS Medical? Uh, the reaction's good, very good. Uh, our our customers continue to be very excited about our products. Our products are the highest quality products available in the marketplace. So, <clears throat> you know, we sell um, uh, medical infusion devices, uh, the, the pumps and the tubing and the needle sets. And our devices are um, absolutely the best on the market, and our customers continue to come back to us and tell us that. And, um, the, uh, for example, our needles are the sharpest needles. They give you the best high-quality flow of the drugs, um, and people love them. And one of the shows that we were just at was uh, IDF, which is uh, uh, it's an autoimmune uh, deficiency foundation. And uh, it's more of a patient-focused uh, um, show. And you actually, it's one of the few shows where you go to and you actually have patients where you, you have children who come who are using our systems. You have adults who are using them. 
and they come to the show to learn more about the infusion because they're on these drugs for their entire life. And they want to know what are the best products out there, how to solve problems, how to troubleshoot. And um, it's really exciting to actually talk to the patients themselves. And, and it's so strange to have a, a, a 10-year-old child walk up to you and start talking to you in, in terms of medical terms, talking about uh, how the infusion works, what kind of needles they use, the length of their needles, and and you say, wow, is this a is this really a ten year old child who, but their life depends on their drugs, and they infuse um, either once a day or once a week or or twice a month, and um, their life is changed by using our products. So they they. They just love us. They literally come to our booth and say, you know, don't change a single thing. I love your products. They, they actually really substantially change my life. And, um, and what's key about that is our products are used for home infusion. Prior to, prior to our uh, products, a lot of patients had to go to clinics or hospitals or doctor's offices to get their infusion of their drugs. And by virtue of the fact that they can use our uh, you know, our mechanical device, which doesn't have any battery power requirements or any, you don't need to be plugged into a wall. You can be sitting at home watching TV or you can put it in its little carry pouch and you can go out and walk the dog while you're infusing. And many people do this. They just, they put their needles in and, um, and they start their infusion and then they go out and walk the dog. And, and by the time they're done, their infusion is done and they have the freedom to do whatever they want to do. It, it really changes their lives. And when you go to a show like IDF and you talk to the patients, it really hits, it, it really hits home. It really is, uh, it makes you feel fantastic to be able to have this much of an impact on, on people's lives. Uh, and, and to have them come up to you and say, wow, you know, you, you've changed my son or my daughter's life and, uh, with these products. So we're very excited about this. Our customers, our patients, everybody continues to um, rave about our products. No other competitor out there has anything like what we do. Um, and uh, so we're, we're very excited and, and continue to get all the positive feedback from the trade shows. Yeah, you see a young person walk up to you like that, and you think it's Doogie Hauser or something, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's amazing. They they uh, they spend a lot of time focused on their care and and what they do, and um, and they really pay attention to their nurses and their doctors, and they learn a lot. It's it's amazing um, how quickly they learn as children um, because they're doing this so frequently that, um, you know, they have to. They have to understand. And, um, you know, they start off with the nurses inserting their needles, their infusion needles, and then their parents usually end up doing it. And then very shortly after that, they just do it themselves. And, and they, don't, they, don't, uh, they don't think twice about it. They just insert the needles. They, they put their drug in their uh, pump, and they turn it on, and, and then they're free to do whatever they want to do. And you're they, doing a lot in foreign markets. Can you elaborate on that? Oh yes, we're um, we're expanding. Uh, you know, it's it's actually a misnomer to think about us as a U.S. Uh, company, even though the majority of our sales are currently in the U.S. We are expanding rapidly throughout Europe right now, and uh, our chief medical officer just got back from Asia, where he made a tour of a whole number of com com uh, countries in Asia. And uh, and uh, we have just taken our first order from Vietnam and uh, gotten registration in a number of Asian countries. So, you know, before we can actually sell our products in countries, uh, we have to be registered with their with their governments or their version of the their FDAs. And um, so we are actively engaged with a number of governments to get uh, to push through our, our registrations in those. Uh, countries, and we have clinical trials going on in, in many locations 
uh, throughout uh, Asia and Europe, and also uh, continuing to do those in the U.S. as well. Uh, we just had um, uh, one of the major drug companies, Shire, uh, came in and uh, wanted to work with us on, a, on uh, expanding their sale of a new drug. And they did a quality audit of us, and literally, I think it was like just a couple of weeks ago, they actually uh, announced to their entire organization in, uh, that uh, we are an approved supplier to Shire. So uh, Shire is going to be a great uh, company to work with, and we're going to help them expand uh, the use of their drugs throughout the world. Wow. And, uh, That's a so huge We are working closely with the drug companies as well. That's a great announcement. Yeah. Wow. Michael? Yep. What would a user of the product uh, acquire uh, through utilization? What would they be, how would they be improving themselves? How would a user, you mean in terms of the drugs or their yes. our device? Well, yes. the, our, our patients right now, <clears throat> this is one of the other things, is the, the majority of our patients are immune deficient patients. They have uh, compromised immune systems. Their bodies aren't creating enough immunoglobulins to protect them from uh, getting sick on a regular basis. So basically their immune systems aren't capable of fighting off um, even the common cold. I mean, the, the, a lot of them have to avoid contact with their friends, and a lot of them can't, can't leave their homes unless they get their immunoglobulin drugs. And uh, so the drug companies, whether it's Shire, CSL, Octopharma, uh, a number of other uh, a number of, a number of other uh, companies, they're all creating these um, immunoglobulin drugs, which are, I look at them and I, I think these are like miracle drugs because they essentially enhance the immune system of these patients. And these patients who previously could not go out, the kids couldn't go out and play with their friends, they can't go to school for fear that they would actually catch a cold and get pneumonia. And... Um, so these immunoglobulin drugs actually boost their immune systems so that they can fight off uh, all of these common colds and, and uh, viruses and things. And so the drugs are, are expanding and becoming uh, more and more available on the marketplace. And all of these drugs need a delivery device. So in the past, people would pu put them in through an IV or through a PIC line or something like that, but when you do that, the, you, you get a, a huge surge within the body uh, where the, the immune system in the body jumps up really quickly, but then it drops off fairly quickly as well. And they talk about these as the trough levels, the, the levels of the, um, uh, the immunoglobulins within their systems. So basically when you stick with some of the traditional systems of delivery, like IV uh, uh, delivery, the trough levels jump way up and then they come way down. And you don't, the patients have a hard time maintaining a steady level of this drug. Well, using a subcutaneous delivery, which is what we do, a subcutaneous is where the drug is delivered just below the surface of the skin into this subcutaneous tissue. And when you do that, you're not putting it directly into the bloodstream. So you're basically creating a deposit of the drug within the, within the patient's body, typically like in the abdomen level, uh, abdomen, abdomen area or in the thighs. So you create, create a deposit of this drug in the patient's body, and the body absorbs it slowly over time rather than putting it directly into the bloodstream. Well, when you do this... Um, what all the studies show is that the trough levels remain constant then over a much longer period of time. So the, the patient's uh, protection is not going up and down, up and down, up and down. They maintain a steady protection over a longer period of time. So they're healthier. They become healthier patients over a longer period of time. So subcutaneous delivery is the way that these drugs are being delivered going forward. And what's 
we're learning all of this through these primary immune uh, deficient patients that subcutaneous is, is a better method of delivering drugs. So now what we're seeing is doctors are saying, hey, if this is true for this drug, why can't I do the same thing with pain medications? Why can't I do the same thing with antibiotics and have the same positive effect? So um, they're looking at a number of different indications, a number of different drugs now. And so the, the use of subcutaneous delivery, which is what we do uh, with our pumps and our needles and our tubing, is, is becoming a, a growing marketplace because it's a more effective way of delivering the drugs to the patients. It actually makes them healthier. And uh, so the patients get a huge benefit from us. And uh, not only that, they don't have to go to a clinic or a hospital to get this. They can do this at home. So uh, our business is not only expanding within the, the primary area that we, we target, but it's expanding into a number of different indications where people are now ex um, experimenting with uh, other drugs and using, delivering them through subcutaneous. So we're pretty excited about the fact that not, o not only is our primary market growing, but the, the secondary market for all these other drugs is growing as well, and, and many drug companies are developing uh, new drugs specifically for subcutaneous delivery and finding that they can, they can be far more effective and solve patients' problems by doing this. So our future is really bright. It's, it's, um, it's an ever-growing business, not only from a... Uh, a drug company level, but patient levels, uh, indication levels, uh, on a global basis, uh, it's growing everywhere, and the whole market is moving to the home infusion. So, you know, if people want to do their infusions at home. They don't want to spend an entire day sitting in a hospital doing their infusion when they can sit at home and do it in an hour at home. Sure. So yeah. you know, and it's so it's really convenient for the patients. So how, so um, uh, Eric? How large a market uh, would you say Vietnam is is going to turn into for you guys? Um, you know, if I had a crystal ball, I I probably wouldn't be working. <laughs> but um, we we are um, very optimistic because. Whether you realize it or not, uh, a market like Vietnam, it, people, it's funny, my, I don't want to give away my age, but, but I remember, you know, the Vietnam that was the wartime Vietnam. Oh, yeah, so do and, I. Yep. And um, it, it is not that anymore. There is a, uh, there's a wealthy class of people there now because a lot of manufacturing has moved there. There is a huge middle class now. Um, it's very much a modern day, you know, modern day comp country in many respects. So they want to have modern day technology, modern day medical drugs, and so the drug companies are launching there. We we basically went into Vietnam, for example, following a drug company. <clears throat> so the drug company said, "We need your help. We can't launch our drug here without you guys." So we followed them in. We got our registration. And um, so as the drug continues to grow and the doctors continue to prescribe it, then uh, basically we, we ride on the coattails of the drugs uh, into these countries. So we believe that that market will continue to grow for us. We, it's just starting out. And, uh, and there's really no telling how big it'll get. It all has to do with the patient population and the, the, you know, the number of patients that are being um, diagnosed in this particular case, with uh, primary immune deficiency, so uh, which tends to be somewhere between five and seven percent of the population, so it can be quite substantial uh, going forward. Wow! How long does it take to put the device on for someone, for a patient at home? Uh, to actually, the device itself is is once you. Uh, basically, you have to you start by washing your hands, and then the drugs are delivered in a, a, a glass vial, and you um, you transfer the drug from the vial into a syringe, 
And then basically you just connect the tubing and the needles. You prime your, your, prime your uh, tubing, and then you just insert the needles. So we're talking just a matter of minutes. I mean, uh, once you're trained on doing this, it's just a matter of minutes. You uh, insert the needles, um, and you put a tegaderm over them to hold them on. And then you literally, it's just one switch on the, uh, on the pump. You turn the switch on, and it starts the infusion process. Now, the infusion process itself uh, typically takes about an hour or maybe a little bit longer because you're, you're infusing a, a, a fairly large quantity of drug um, at a very slow rate because you want to put it in slowly so that you're not hurting this, the tissue of the skin. And uh, so it takes about an hour, uh, hour and a half sometimes for an infusion to be complete. But the actual setup is only minutes, the actual setup in, until you're, you're doing it. So what the patients love is they can do it at their convenience. You know, when, when they're finally sitting down at night and they're going to watch a TV show, they can, you know, basically do their setup, put their, insert their needles and start their infusion. They can watch their TV show. And by the time the TV show's done, you know, the infusion's over with. So it's huge convenience factor. And that's one of the things we heard over and over again from patients is they just love being able to do this at their own convenience. And um, so, and the funny thing is people say, well, why is that a big deal? It's a big deal because the more you can make it convenient for the patient, the more compliant the patient is. That means that they're taking their drugs at the right time, on the right schedule, um, and when you have compliant patients, you have healthier patients because their trough levels remain constant. They're, they're, they, they are just healthier. They're less likely to catch a cold or get pneumonia or to get sick. And so you, compliant patients lead to healthier patients, which leads to lower overall health care costs. Wow. So that's this, you got a great this story, is what Eric. It's all about. Yeah, it great is. Show. What's what's your uh, website at uh, RMS Medical? It's it's RMS Medical Products uh, dot com. All right, and uh, Michael, how's that stock look? It looks fantastic. I mean, it really looks like it's poised to go. It's the cheapest stock on the board. All it right. is yeah, a great buy here. We are R E P R is the symbol. Yeah, R E P R. R E P R. Yep. All right, guys. Well, thank you so much, Eric Bauer, President and CEO of RMS Medical. Thank you very much. Tim Connolly, our oil expert as always. And, of course, Mike King and Charles Moskowitz, who bring you Money Info. Don't forget that newsletter. Every Sunday it comes out. And, uh, boy, I'll tell you, you talk about informative.